Welcome. Since it is summer and many people are on vacation, the Emergency Operations Center decided to do a video update rather than a live town hall. My name is Gérald Cadet, and I will be emceeing the video question and answer session. Joining us today are Fabrice Labeau, Deputy Provost, Student Life and Learning, Chris Buttle, Associate Provost, Teaching and Academic Programs, and Diana Dutton, Associate Vice Principal, Human Resources. Uh, they are here today to answer some common questions they have received over the past month via different channels. We'll try to get through as many questions as we can today. The first question is for you, Fabrice. Before we start, can you just remind us of the context for the university's management of the pandemic? Sure. So um, over the uh, the last uh, several months, we've always mm -hmm. started with health and safety of our people in priority as the uh, as as the uh, as the first priority. Uh, the second priority we always have is to uh, be guided by our academic mission and prioritizing our academic activities. Now that being said, you've all seen it over the last few months. The situation is fluid; things are changing, and that's why we have a, we have been updating everybody on our planning. We continue asking for your uh, your patience. And the, uh, uh, we understand that the uh, ongoing uncertainties are a bit challenging for everybody. But as, as usual, we're trying to give you as much as information as we can when we have it. And so that's also why we have an update today is to uh, give you a sense of what we know today and the, uh, uh, where we go, how we're going forward, keeping in mind that, that things can change quickly, of course. Chris, question for you. We have a question from an instructor. I'm currently scheduled to teach online. When do I find out if I'll get a classroom for, from, for the fall term? And a related question for, for, from students, how do I know whether my class will be in person or online? Thanks for the question. And it's uh, great to be here today. I'm outside Red Path Hall. It's a beautiful day on campus. It's nice to, nice to be here today. Um, so I'll answer the second question first about students. Essentially, it's checking your, your class schedule through Minerva as you would normally go on and, and register and, and, and add classes and drop classes. That's the place where you'll see if there's a, a classroom allocated or not. Uh, and it might, and students will need to check that just before the start of term to understand how we'll be starting the term. So from a student perspective, it's checking that schedule uh, before you start term. From an instructor's perspective, uh, about 65% of our academic activities for the fall are already scheduled in person. So most instructors have a good sense that their, their class will be in person and they have a classroom allocated. And our larger lectures, so many of the lectures that are over 150 in size, the students will expect an online uh, course delivery for the large lectures. Now there's that middle group where some instructors are currently scheduled online and it may, may end up getting a room allocation. In fact, it's quite likely that they will. And those instructors should actually be planning on an in-course, in-person course delivery, but knowing that they're gonna likely or may have to start the term online. So from an instructor's perspective, um, we're gonna make a, a, a decision in August about how the term is gonna start. So they're gonna know before August how it's going to start, but it might also be that they'll be allocated a room after term starts, perhaps a couple of weeks in. So from an instructor's perspective, it's also looking at your class schedule and see and to understand where it's located. And, and if it doesn't yet have a classroom allocated for it, that means it's online. And over time, as we get closer to the start of term, uh, then it might be allocated a classroom. I hope that answers the question. It's a little bit confusing because there are these different parameters at play, but instructors would need to check where they normally check their teaching schedule is where they'll eventually see a room allocation. But we'll also publicize and communicate with the community before the start of term as much as we can about that to give as much certainty as we can. Okay. Uh, another question for you, Chris. If I get a classroom partway through the term, doesn't this mean I have to prepare two versions of my class? Right. So, so that's another question we've received a few times. And, and one of the reasons we, we wanted to have this, this uh, event today is to try to clarify some of these questions. And that's why we're also telling these instructors, and in fact, we sent them an email earlier this week to say, look, you're currently scheduled online, but you might receive a classroom allocation, which means that they have advance notice that they have to build in some flexibility into the mode of delivery. So again, they might start the term online. So maybe those first uh, couple of weeks of lectures, they'll consider 
consider making sure that they're ready for delivery over Zoom, but then recognize that there'll be a, a, a switch to in-person and can then go to the uh, in-person lecturing that they, they would have done more in a pre-pandemic uh, stage. There might be some pieces of the online that they, that they want to maintain, but really once the classroom's allocated, I think the view from an instructor's perspective is to really plan mostly for an in-person, but recognize at the start of term it might be online. So it's not about preparing two different classes, it's about preparing for flexibility and a little bit of adaptation that will be required and then communicating about that with your students so that they're aware. Okay, question for Diana. Um, can I ask someone's vaccination status? Um, well, there's a couple of things that um, you need to be mindful of with respect to vaccination status. And one of them is that uh, vaccination is not mandatory in Quebec. It's a matter of personal choice. And it's also a private medical matter. So the answer is certainly if you're in a position of authority, if you're a supervisor of staff or a professor uh, speaking to one of your students, it is illegal in Quebec to ask the vaccination status. So that's something you have to be very mindful of. And we know this is a hot topic. We know the conversations are, are coming up uh, all over the place right now, but we would really caution you, particularly if you are in a position of authority, not to initiate the discussion. Fabrice, how can I be safe if I don't know the vaccination status of my colleagues, fellow students, lab mates? Why isn't McGill making vaccines mandatory? So let me maybe address the, uh, the, the, the last portion of that question first, the uh, why we're not making uh, vaccination mandatory is that because it's simply because we cannot do it in the, uh, in the Quebec uh, framework. So as the Diana just mentioned, uh, vaccination in Quebec is a, nat is a matter of personal choice. So we cannot actually mandate it at McGill just like that. So that's not the situation we live in. In terms of the, uh, the, 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 the very relevant question, I think to a lot of people, uh, Will I be safe? How will I know I'm safe? I think it, it really comes from a, 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 a set of layers of protection that are put in place. So uh, while we will be at the one meter distancing, for instance, there's going to be distancing, there's going to be a potential mass, there may be plexiglass dividers in some specific areas. So there's a lot of measures in place that, of course, always start with the fact that nobody will symptoms with symptoms will be allowed to come on campus and there's going to be frequent hand washing. There's going to be a hand sanitary station, et cetera. So all the measures you have seen in the last 16 months, there's going to be versions of that when you come back to campus. And when we move to the no distancing phase, that's where at a point where at a population level, we have enough people vaccinated in a population that the fact that some individuals uh, are not vaccinated does not really change your situation and your level of safety. The, uh, the, the, at the level of vaccination we're looking at, really the, uh, the, the, the transmission of the disease is going to be slowed down to a point where it's going to be a lot safer to actually interact with people. Okay. Another question for you, Fabrice. Um, Montreal is opening up and I'm able to go to the bars. Why isn't Frush happening in the way it normally does? So I, I understand that the uh, we're, we're in this weird position now where uh, the, there's the whole province is reopening. You can do a lot of things that you couldn't do a month ago uh, uh, as of today. Uh, but as we're uh, looking at organizing the fall, we also realize there's a lot of planning that needs to take place and it takes resources. And so an event like Frosh is not something you improvise. It's actually two months and more of planning. And so without a certainty that we'll have the resources to, uh, to allocate to run such a big event, it's very difficult to, uh, to make it happen. If you decide to go to a bar, well, you can do that the night off and off you go. But an event like Frosh and a lot of other big events that are, that are in-person events require a lot of planning. And, we don't, and when we don't have complete certainty about the conditions under which we'll hold the event, it's very difficult to do so. So that's why we have decided that this year, there won't be any large on-campus events like Frosh. Okay. Question for Chris. I'm worried I won't be here at the start of term. How big a deal is this? What academic accommodations are available for students and if they can't come to campus? Thanks for the question. Um, 
One of the reasons we made an announcement back in February about our expectations was to try to give as much advance notice as possible to our students who are traveling from outside of Quebec, outside the Montreal area, in terms of, of uh, a coming, coming to McGill for the fall in person. So the expectation is that students will be here. And all, by all accounts, our international students are able to enter the country. Uh, and we have uh, a high degree of confidence that people are able to get here if they plan ahead. And of course, for some students, um, planning ahead might be really challenging, and we recognize that there are challenges related to that. So if students are facing particular uh, COVID-related uh, challenges with respect to the start of term or other needs for academic accommodations, that might be relevant in that scenario where we still have a lot of proportion of our classes online. When we get to the more regular schedule without the physical distancing, where much more of our activities are back to normal, then those extra accommodations won't be relevant. But it might be at the start of the term, students might need specific accommodations. There will be an online form available to students where they can indicate a need for accommodations and the Office of the Dean of Students will ensure that the appropriate faculty receives that, that notification and works on a case-by-case -case basis around an academic uh, accommodation. But that being said, I, I wanted to be clear also in that we have to manage expectations and, and, and I think students need to do everything they can to get here for the start of term. If they're a couple of days late, that's still the drop ad period. So there, there, we recognize that there's a little bit of fluidity at the start of term, but there really has to be a plan to get here. And there has to be uh, a recognition that, that the in-person experiences with respect to teaching will happen starting at the start of class. So the message is a little bit challenging because some students are really worried about getting here at the start of the term. Do everything you can, plan, uh, make sure you're here for the beginning of term. If you're a little bit late, uh, you might be able to get some accommodations, but you have to be reasonable in what you might expect for accommodations because, again, most students will be here and, and ready to, to do their academic activities then. Okay. Diana, uh, I don't work in a student-facing area. It's not clear to me why I should return to work in my office on campus. I can do my work from home very effectively. Um. There's no doubt that uh, by and large, our staff have been able to work effectively throughout the pandemic. I mean, from a faculty and a staff standpoint, we've really delivered throughout the past months. Um, but we were doing that in government mandated circumstances. So I think it's important for people to be mindful that there's a big difference between doing something because we have to and doing something because we've made a deliberate decision to do so. And as we're exiting this government mandated phase and moving into what really will amount to a new normal for McGill, we are going to be making decisions about how we operate in all spheres of our activity. And it's really important that our staff be back on campus, all of our staff back on campus as our students and our faculty as we go through this, because we wanna make informed decisions about how we should be operating. We're probably moving to some kind of a hybrid model. Certainly that's what we'll be assessing. And we need all of our staff uh, involved in that process and, and, and present here. And I want to point out as well that the senior administration has made it very clear that McGill is going to continue to be an in-person institution. We're a community. We're physically based around two campuses. We've always thought of ourselves as a community, faculty, staff, and students, and we don't want to lose that sense of community as we, as we move forward. Question for you, Chris. <laughs> I would prefer to teach online. How do I request that as an option? So I wanna go back to something I said earlier. There are some of the larger courses that will remain uh, being taught online. And so if that question comes from an instructor who's already scheduled to teach a class larger than 150 in, in size, it's most likely that they will remain teaching online for the, for the fall semester. Now, that other category of instructors who might currently be scheduled online but be moving to an in-person environment, the expectation is that the, the classroom will be used for teaching activities. How that's going to be used is, of course, up to the instructor, whether it's group activities, inquiry-based learning, or standard lectures, that will vary. If an instructor has particular uh, interests in, in advancing some of the pedagogy and some of the teaching innovations in their class that might 
include some additional online components. That's reasonable. An instructor can talk to their chair or their associate dean to talk through some of those options, but the default position is in person. Okay, a follow up question, Chris. Will I be able to wear a mask in my classroom even if it's not mandated? Thanks for that one. We, we do have a lot of questions about masks and we know that globally there's a lot of discussion about masks and we know other jurisdictions there's changes in how people are as the pandemic uh, you know, evolves over time. Uh, right now the situation's fluid in Quebec. We're not, we're not sure yet what the situation will be for the start of classes. But the hypothetical scenario that, that is mentioned in the question is that if masks aren't, aren't mandatory, can people still choose to wear them? And the answer there is yes. If, if, if students still want to wear, wear masks when they're in the teaching context, if, if, there's, if people want to wear masks when they're not required to, that's absolutely uh, something that they'll be allowed to do, for sure. Okay. Fabrice, why are we coming back to work or to school when new variants are emerging? How can we be sure that we are safe returning to campus? Well, so the, the, in terms of reasoning, I think the, uh, Diana mentioned earlier that we definitely are an in-person institution. The, the campus life is, it's part, it's key to what we are. It's part of the, uh, the McGill's, the uh, spirit. It's, it's really what this institution is. So we need to get back to campus. And so the conditions that we face now are such that we can actually do it and we won't do it at any point price and an adding cost. We have plans and plans to ensure everybody's safety. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, we have a plan uh, for one meter distancing and we could operate on one meter distancing. We have a plan for when we reach a certain threshold of vaccination and then we can remove the distancing. We also have a, a backup plan in case things really get worse in Montreal. So we are ready to face these different possibilities. And, and I understand there's a lot of anxiety from people after 16 months being remote, being at home, etc. Uh, but also want to make sure to, that people understand that we will, of course, have accommodations for people who have specific, uh, specific medical conditions that would prevent them from coming back to campus. Um, we're coming back to, uh, to buildings where we, we know what the ventilation situation is. We have a look at our ventilation and, and it's actually safe of parameters that people want to be reassured about. And I think we, we, we have done that work of making sure that everything is going to be safe when people will come back. Okay. Maybe, could, I, could I add one comment to that? And it's something that I have found over the last few months when coming back to the campus for an occasional day, even though there's going to be a progressive return. Uh, and I've seen many of you on campus occasionally as well. Uh, just refamiliarizing is is something that that I think will really help a, a lot of people who might be feeling a little bit bit anxious. It, it certainly helped me, and the reason I mention it following Fabrice's comment is visualizing the space and visualizing the way that the campus is 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 has been set up in in during the pandemic is really valuable. That'll shift a little bit over time as we switch the distancing, et cetera. But it's it can be quite reassuring to. And I found that to visualize and come to campus, even just for a half day now and then before you really return progressively, I think it can be a valuable experience. Okay. Follow-up question again to you, Fabrice. What will happen if the COVID situation becomes worse in Montreal? Well, so there, there's possibilities here, but the uh, it's it's very possible that the uh, new variants emerge or were hit by the uh, by some other variants in Montreal. The at the end of the day, what we're all working towards is vaccination. The more we get vaccinated as a community, uh, the safer we will be overall, and the more we'll be able to resist that next variant, that next wave. And so, um, as as we mentioned, we're ready to go to less distancing if the situation improves because of the vaccination and that's really what we're expecting but also ready to move back to more distancing if things get worse in Montreal so we're not going to be uh, 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 working with no distancing and any of the conditions that we're talking about no matter what of course we will follow public health recommendations and adapt to a potentially a worsening situation okay uh, question for you Diana why can't McGill staff have the same work from home arrangements as the Quebec Civil Service? Um, well, I think I'd like to point out uh, right off that the government, government themselves have specified that 
this program will not apply to the uh, education and health sectors because their reality is very different. So I think that, you know, leads us to the fact that the university is a very different workplace than a government office. Our clients are physically located with us and we have a very varied workforce. Uh, a university is like a city. We have people doing all types of work. Um, and it's very hard to think you know, right off the bat, here's one model, it will fit everybody. Obviously, that's not viable. Um, but we are very interested in looking closely at the hybrid model. But that itself is uncharted water for us. We know very well what it is to be face to face, all of us on campus, and we know what it is to be entirely remote under rather anomalous circumstances. But we don't know what it is to have a workforce who are partially at home, partially on campus, some fully on campus. And, and how do you navigate through that? It's, it's a more complex situation for a manager. And we need to examine how do we support our managers? What are the implications for the workforce? It's not just about whether you're client facing, the nature of your work, how complex is it? How codependent are you on the work of, of other colleagues? And, and what training and technology might you need to do better in terms of splitting your time from home and, and at the office? And, you know, we're very decentralized. Whatever models we put out there, we want to ensure that they are equitably and consistently managed in, in each area of the university. So we need time to evaluate all of this. And that's why we've put an interim program in place, uh, wherein staff with the authorization of their managers will be able to work uh, up to 40% of their time from home. Okay. Um, question for Fabrice. Uh, since fully vaccinated travelers do not have to quarantine, why does the university still have travel restrictions in place? When will graduate students be able to travel internationally for research? So the, it, it's true that now the, uh, there's, there's been some additional uh, accommodations in, in terms of quarantine. So not everybody has to quarantine, but the, uh, the travel advisories that the, uh, that the government of Canada has in place hasn't changed. So there's still a, uh, a worldwide travel advisory from Global Affairs Canada uh, asking to avoid uh, non-essential travel. And so this is really what is guiding us also in our decision to uh, continue suspending travel travel uh, for university sponsored activities is because there is still a travel advisory in place. So as these tra this travel advisory is lifted or it may become a regional travel advisory for different parts of the world, we'll adapt our policies. But for now, I think we'll, uh, we'll continue having the, uh, the overall uh, suspension on the, uh, on the uh, travel on, for university purposes. When we will be able to, uh, to lift that, I think will depend on how uh, fast the, uh, the travel advisory will be lifted. But we're hopeful that the, uh, at some point towards the beginning of the fall, it's going to be a better situation. Okay. Question for Chris. Question from an instructor. Can I have my midterms in person? Thanks for that question. So uh, indeed, it's it's possible for instructors to hold uh, some assessments in person, whether it's a, a midterm or other kinds of, of tests or quizzes. Uh, a little while ago, we, we worked with faculties to understand uh, which instructors wanted to, to see about scheduling their midterms in person. And we're going to have that information out to instructors very soon. But if instructors wanted in-person midterms, it's highly likely that that will be able to happen. An instructor may want an online midterm for, uh, for different benefits that that brings in terms of assessment, and that's also possible. The only caveat I would add, though, is we'd like to see consistency so students are aware at the start of term what those midterms, how, what the format and the, and the modality of those midterms will be. But indeed, both are, both are possible. And I, I'm anticipating another question about final exams, so I'll take that one as well. Uh, later in the summer, we'll certainly go through the process of scheduling final exams, and we are cautiously optimistic that a, a more... Um, regular regular rhythm of final exams will happen and possibly in the, in the field house or in the gymnasium on the downtown campus or the Centennial Center at McDonald campus as the spaces for those examinations. But we're also going to build in backup plans in case we need to. Okay. Question for Fabrice. 
what quarantine accommodations are available for students coming to Canada? Is there a possibility of getting reimbursement from McGill? So, the, and I realize this is part of the uh, a lot of questions we're getting from our international students in particular around quarantines, around the uh, vaccination, recognition of vaccination, etc. Uh, we're posting a lot of information on that as we get it on the uh, International Student Services website, and we're communicating regularly with their international students to make sure that they, they have the latest information. So, in terms of quarantine, uh, you, you uh, will remember that uh, people who are doubly vaccinated with a vaccine that is recognized recognized in Canada won't have to quarantine, uh, but the others still do as of today. So we have limited spaces in our residences to accommodate some students for quarantines. Otherwise, we uh, will redirect the, uh, our students to uh, hotels in Montreal. Um, and we'll, of course, keep people posted on the uh, any evolution uh, on that front and the uh, uh, potential additional lifting of the uh, the need to uh, quarantine for other individuals. Um, in terms of the uh, of financial uh, considerations, we, we've ha- we have had for quite a while now uh, specific financial aid that is, the, uh, that is dis- disbursed on a need basis to our students and administered by our, our scholarship and student aid office that is really geared towards the overall financial needs of students, including needs that may arise from the uh, added cost of quarantine, et cetera. So I think that's, that's really part of the, uh, the, the, the global envelope of uh, need-based student aid. And so if as a student you feel that this is a financial hurdle to your coming to McGill, really please do contact the the scholarship and student aid office. Okay. Question for Diana. Will accommodations be made for staff, faculty who are unable to be vaccinated and or have a medical condition that puts them at greater risk of COVID-19 complications? Yeah, um, basically the process is the same as a member of faculty or staff would follow any time that they have a medical, documented medical condition that they think is going to affect their ability to work. Essentially, they will get in touch with our disability office who will review that documentation, make a determination uh, if an accommodation uh, is required and, and what those possibilities are. Okay. Question for Chris. Administrative and support staff will have two weeks to ramp up from 30% on-site work to 100% on-site work once the government allows universities to move to no physical distancing. Will the two-week ramp-up period apply for instructors as well? So uh, we've already given the instructors notice that they're likely going to have to switch uh, from teaching remotely to in-person for those instructors that are currently scheduled remotely who will then later get a room allocation. So the advance warning has already kind of gone out that this is going to happen at some point in the fall. Uh, We're going to give as much advance notice as possible to the community about that particular switch. Uh, It's unlikely to be a full two weeks because we'll, we'll likely have to act a little bit quicker than that, but we'll be in very close contact with instructors before that to do our best to, to give advance warning. And essentially what's going to happen then is over the course of a weekend there'll be new room allocations uploaded in our system so people will then see that they will go to a different classroom or have a classroom where they didn't before and then they can start preparing for many instructors uh it, it, if they don't have a lecture on the monday they'll have a couple extra days and also i recognize there'll be a little bit of uh confusion on that first day and because people have to find new We'll actually advertise what those spaces will be before the start of term to try to reduce some of those confusion. But I think we need to expect a a little bit of uh, wandering around campus happening when we do uh, redo that particular class uh, class allocation. Okay. Fabrice, uh, the Quebec government is now talking about vaccination passports for September. What does this mean for Miguel? Well, so this is this is part of the uh, the brand new information. So that's information from last week, where the government announced indeed that they may be using vaccination passports as of the fall. Uh, and so that's part of the, the fluidity of the uh, of the situation. But uh, at a high level, I don't think it will have a lot of impact on our operations at McGill because the way this has been announced by the government is uh, for use specifically in cases of outbreaks and to give access or not not to non-essential services. And it's been recognized by the government right away that education is an essential service. So maybe if the situation gets different in terms of the uh, the, the public health situation, uh, there may be restrictions imposed on 
non-academic activities on campus, but we're, we're clearly not there as of today. Okay. A question for Diana. Uh, I have heard about a new models of work pilot project. When will that project help us change how we work at McGill? Um, we expect that the project will be up and running by late August, and it should run until about the end of March 2023, so about a year and a half. But we're going to be learning actively throughout that period of time. We'll be assessing the various iterations of that model. We're also going to be gathering data related to the interim flexible work arrangement. So within five, six months, we're going to have a good deal of data that's going to enable us to start thinking through and even potentially drafting some of our guidelines as we move towards a more formal policy. And it's conceivable that we may start to see some, some new things being implemented, uh, as I say, you know, six months, nine months uh, into the project. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chris, <laughs> Diana, and Fabrice. This concludes the question period. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending and participating. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you.